Chapter Sixteen of Planet of the Damned by Harry Harrison. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Sixteen. Ulf joined them as they looked down at the exposed brain of the Magter. The thing was so clearly evident that even Ulf noticed it. I have seen dead animals and my people dead with their heads open, but I have never seen anything like that before he said what is it brian asked the invader the alien you were looking for leah told him the magter's brain was only two-thirds of what would have been its normal size instead of filling the skull completely it shared the space with a green amorphous shape this was ridged somewhat like a brain but the green shape had still darker nodules and extensions Leah took her scalpel and gently prodded the dark, moist mass. "'It reminds me very much of something that I've seen before on Earth,' she said. "'The green fly, Drapanosiphum platinoides, and an unusual organ it has, called the Sudova. Now that I have seen this growth in the Magter skull, I can think of a positive parallel. The fly, Drapanosiphum, also has a large green organ, only it fills half of the body cavity instead of the head. Its identity puzzled biologists for years, and they had a number of complex theories to explain it. Finally, someone managed to dissect and examine it. The Sudova turned out to be a living plant, a yeast-like growth that helps with the green fly's digestion. It produces enzymes that enable the fly to digest the great amounts of sugar it gets from plant juice. That's not unusual, Brian said, puzzled. Termites and human beings are a couple of other creatures whose digestion is helped by internal flora. What's the difference in the green fly? Reproduction, mainly. All the other gut-living plants have to enter the host and establish themselves as outsiders, permitted to remain as long as they are useful. The green fly and its yeast plant have a permanent symbiotic relationship that is essential to the existence of both. The plant spores appear in many places throughout the fly's body, but they are always in the germ cells. Every egg cell has some, and every egg that grows to maturity is infected with the plant spores. The continuation of the symbiosis is unbroken and guaranteed. Do you think those green spheres in the magter's blood cells could be the same kind of thing? Brian asked. I'm sure of it, Leah said. It must be the same process. There are probably green spheres throughout the Magter's bodies. Spores are offspring of those things in their brains. Enough will find their way to the germ cells to make sure that every young Magter is infected at birth. While the child is growing, so is the symbiote. Probably a lot faster, since it seems to be a simpler organism. I imagine it is well established in the brain pan within the first six months of the infant's life. But why? Brian asked. What does it do? I'm only guessing now, but there is plenty of evidence that gives us an idea of its function. I'm willing to bet that the symbiote itself is not a simple organism. It's probably an amalgam of plant and animal like most of the other creatures on Dis. The thing is just too complex to have developed since mankind has been on this planet. The magter must have caught the symbiotic infection eating some distant animal, the symbiote lived and flourished in its new environment, well protected by a bony skull in a long-lived host. In exchange for food, oxygen, and comfort, the brain symbiote must generate hormones and enzymes that enable the magna to survive. Some of these might aid digestion, enabling the magna to eat any plant or animal life they can lay their hands on. The symbiote might produce sugars, scavenge the blood of toxins, there are so many things it could do, things it must have done, since the Magter are obviously the dominant life form on this planet. They paid a high price for the symbiote, but it didn't matter to race survival until now. Did you notice that the Magter's brain is no smaller than normal? It must be. Or how else could that brain symbiote fit inside the skull with it? Brian said. If the Magter's total brain were smaller in volume than normal, 
it could fit into the remaining space in the cranial hollow but the brain is full-sized it is just that part of it is missing absorbed by the symbiote the frontal lobes brian said with sudden realization this hellish growth has performed a prefrontal lobotomy it's done even more than that leah said separating the convolutions of the gray matter with her scalpel to uncover a green filament beneath these tendrils penetrate further back into the brain but always remain in the cerebrum the cerebellum appears to be untouched apparently just the higher functions of mankind have been interfered with selectively destruction of the frontal lobes made the magter creatures without emotions or ability for really abstract thought apparently they survived better without these there must have been some horrible failures before the right balance was struck the final product is a man plant animal symbiote that is admirably adapted for survival on this disaster world no emotions to cause complications or desires that might interfere with pure survival complete ruthlessness mankind has always been strong on this anyway so it didn't take much of a push the other disans like Ulf here managed to survive without turning into such a creature so why was it necessary for the magter to go so far nothing is necessary in evolution you know that leah said many variations are possible and all the better ones continue you might say that Ulf's people survive but the magter survive better if off-world contact hadn't been re-established i imagine that the magter would slowly have become the dominant race only they won't have the chance now it looks as though they have succeeded in destroying both races with their suicidal urge that's the part that doesn't make sense brian said the magter have survived and climbed right to the top of the evolutionary heap here yet they are suicidal how does it happen they haven't been wiped out before this individually they have been aggressive to the point of suicide they will attack anything and everything with the same savage lack of emotion luckily there are no bigger animals on this planet so where they have died as individuals their utter ruthlessness has guaranteed their survival as a group now they are faced with a problem that is too big for their half destroyed minds to handle their personal policy has become their planetary policy and that's never a very smart thing they are like men with knives who have killed all the men who were only armed with stones now they are facing men with guns and they are going to keep charging and fighting until they are all dead it's a perfect case of the utter impartiality of the forces of evolution men infected by this disan life form were the dominant creatures on this planet the creature in the magter's brain was a true symbiote then giving something and receiving something making a union of symbiotes where all were stronger together than any could be separately now this has changed the magter brain cannot understand the concept of racial death in a situation where it must be understood to be able to survive therefore the brain creature is no longer a symbiote but a parasite and as a parasite it must be destroyed brian broke in we're not fighting shadows any more he exulted we've found the enemy and it's not the magter at all just a sort of glorified tapeworm that is too stupid to know when it is killing itself off does it have a brain can it think i doubt it very much leah said a brain would be of absolutely no use to it so even if it originally possessed reasoning powers they would be gone by now symbiotes or parasites that live internally like this always degenerate to an absolute minimum of functions tell me about it what is this thing ulv broke in prodding the soft form of the brain symbiote he had heard all their excited talk but had not understood a word explain it to him will you leah as best you can brian said looking at her and he realized how exhausted she was and sit down while you do it you're long overdue for a rest 
I'm going to try. He broke off when he looked at his watch. It was four in the afternoon, less than eight hours to go. What was he to do? Enthusiasm faded as he realized that only half of the problem was solved. The bombs would drop on schedule unless the Nijorders could understand the significance of this discovery. Even if they understood, would it make any difference to them? The threat of the hidden cobalt bombs would not be changed. With this thought came the guilty realization that he had forgotten completely about Telt's death. Even before he contacted the Nijord fleet, he must tell Hyes and his rebel army what had happened to Telt and his sandcar. Also about the radioactive traces. They couldn't be checked against the records now to see how important they might be, but Hyes might make another raid on the strength of the suspicion. This call wouldn't take long. Then he would be free to tackle Professor Commander Kraft. Carefully setting the transmitter on the frequency of the rebel army, he sent out a call to Hyes. There was no answer. When he switched to receive, all he heard was static. There was always a chance the set was broken. He quickly twisted the transmitter to the frequency of his personal radio, then whistled in the microphone. The received signal was so loud that it hurt his ears. He tried to call Hyes again, and was relieved to get a response this time. "'Brian Brand here. Can you read me? I want to talk to Hyes at once.' It came as a shock that it was Professor Commander Kraft who answered. I'm sorry, Brian, but it's impossible to talk to Hyes. We are monitoring his frequency, and your call was relayed to me. Hyes and his rebels lifted ship about half an hour ago, and are already on the way back to Nijord. Are you ready to leave now? It will soon become dangerous to make any landings. Even now I will have to ask for volunteers to get you out of there. Hyes and the rebel army gone? Brian assimilated the thought. He had been thrown off balance when he realized he was talking to Kraft. If they're gone, well, there's nothing I can do about it, he said. I was going to call you so I can talk to you now. Listen, and try to understand. You must cancel the bombing. I found out about the Magter, found what causes their mental aberration. If we can correct that, we can stop them from attacking, Nijord. Can they be corrected by midnight tonight? Kraft broke in. He was abrupt and sounded almost angry. Even saints get tired. No, of course not. Brian frowned at the microphone, realizing the talk was going all wrong, but not knowing how to remedy it. But it won't take too long. I have evidence here that will convince you that what I say is the truth. I believe you without seeing it, Brian. The trace of anger was gone from Kraft's voice now and it was heavy with fatigue and defeat. I'll admit you are probably right. A little while ago I admitted to Hyes, too, that he was probably right in his original estimation of the correct way to tackle the problem of Dis. We have made a lot of mistakes, and in making them we have run out of time. I'm afraid that is the only fact that is relevant now. The bombs fall at twelve, and even then they may drop too late. A ship is already on its way from Nijord with my replacement. I exceeded my authority by running a day past the maximum the technicians gave me. I realize now I was gambling the life of my own world in the vain hope I could save Dis. They can't be saved. They're dead. I won't hear any more about it. You must listen. I must destroy the planet below me. That is what I must do. That fact will not be changed by anything you say. All the off-worlders, other than your party, are gone. I am sending a ship down now to pick you up. As soon as that ship lifts, I am going to drop the first bombs. Now, tell me where you are so they can come for you. Don't threaten me, Kraft. Brian shook his fist at the radio in an excess of anger. You are a killer and a world destroyer. Don't try to make yourself out as anything else. I have the knowledge to avert this slaughter, and you won't listen to me. And I know where the cobalt bombs are, in the Magder Tower that Heiss raided last night. Get those bombs, and there is no need to drop any of your own. I'm sorry, Brian. 
I appreciate what you're trying to do, but at the same time I know the futility of it. I'm not going to accuse you of lying, but do you realize how thin your evidence sounds from this end? First a dramatic discovery of the cause of the Magda's intransigency? Then, when that has no results, you suddenly remember that you know where the bombs are. The best-kept Magda secret. I don't know for sure, but there is a very good chance it is so, Brian said, trying to repair his defenses. Telt made readings. He had other records of radioactivity in the same Magda keep. Proof that something is there. But Telt is dead now. The records destroyed. Don't you see? He broke off, realizing how vague and unprovable his case was. This was defeat. The radio was silent with just the hum of the carrier wave as Kraft waited for him to continue. When Brian did speak, his voice was empty of all hope. "'Send your ship down,' he said tiredly. "'We're in a building that belonged to the Light Metals Trust Limited, a big warehouse of some kind. I don't know the address here, but I'm sure you have someone there who can find it. We'll be waiting for you. You win, Kraft.' He turned off the radio. End of chapter 16「Chapter 17 of Planet of the Damned by Harry Harrison. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17 Do you mean what you said about giving up? Leah asked. Brian realized that she had stopped talking to Ulf some time ago and had been listening to his conversation with Kraft. He shrugged, trying to put his feeling into words. <sighs> We've tried and almost succeeded, but if they won't listen, what can we do? What can one man possibly do against a fleet loaded with H-bombs? As if in answer to the question, Old's voice drowned him out, the harsh, dissonant words slashing the silence of the room. "'Kill you, the enemy,' he said. "'Kill you, Umedrick!' He shouted the last word, and his hand flashed to his belt. In a single motion he lifted his blowgun and placed it to his lips. A tiny dart quivered in the already dead flesh of the creature in the magter's skull. The action had all the symbolism of a broken lance, the declaration of war. Ulf understands it a lot better than you might think, Leah said. He knows things about symbiosis and mutualism that would get him a job as a lecturer in any university on earth. He knows just what the brain symbiote is and what it does. They even have a word for it one that never appeared in our Disson language lessons. A life form that you can live with or cooperate with is called Medverk. One that works to destroy you is Ummedverk. He also understands that life forms can change and be Medverk or Ummedverk at different times. He has just decided that the brain symbiote is Ummedverk and he is out to kill it. So will the rest of the Dissons as soon as he can show them the evidence and explain. "'You're sure of this?' Brian asked, interested in spite of himself. "'Positive. The Dissons have an absolute attitude towards survival. You should realize that. Not the same as the Magter, but not much different in the results. They will kill the brain symbiotes, even if it means killing every Magter who harbors one.' If that's the case, we can't leave now, Brian said. With these words, it suddenly became clear what he had to do. The ship is coming down now from the fleet. Get in it and take the body of the Magter. I won't go. Where will you be? she asked, shocked. Fighting the Magter. My presence on the planet means that Kraft won't keep his threat to drop the bombs any earlier than the midnight deadline. That would be deliberately murdering me. I doubt if my presence past midnight will stop him, but it should keep the bombs away at least until then. 
what will you accomplish besides committing suicide leah pleaded you just told me how a single man can't stop the bombs what will happen to you at midnight i'll be dead but in spite of that i can't run away not now i must do everything possible right up until the last instant ulf and i will go to the magter tower try to find out if the bombs are there he will fight on our side now he may even know more about the bombs things that he didn't want to tell me before we can get help from his people some of them must know where the bombs are being native to this planet leah started to say something but he rushed on drowning out her words you have just as big a job show the magter to craft explain the significance of the brain parasite to him try to get him to talk to highs about the last raid try to get him to hold off the attack i'll keep the radio with me and as soon as i know anything i'll call in this is all last resort finger in the dike kind of stuff but it is all we can do because if we do nothing it means the end of dis leah tried to argue with him but he wouldn't listen to her he only kissed her and with a lightness he did not feel tried to convince her that everything would be all right in their hearts they both knew it wouldn't be but they left it that way because it was the least painful solution a sudden rumbling shook the building and the windows darkened as a ship settled in the street outside the nijard crew came in with guns pointed alert for anything after a little convincing they took the cadaver as well as leah when they lifted ship brian watched the spacer become a pinpoint in the sky and vanish he tried to shake off the feeling that this was the last time he would see any of them let's get out of here fast he told ulf picking up the radio before anyone comes around to see why the ship landed what will you do ulf asked as they went down the street towards the desert what can we do in the few hours we have left he pointed at the sun nearing the horizon brian shifted the weight of the radio to his other hand before replying get to the magter tower we raided last night that's the best chance the bombs might be there unless you know where the bombs are Ulf shook his head i do not know but some of my people may we will capture a magter then kill him so they can all see the oom edvark then they will tell us everything they know the tower first then for bombs or a sample magter what's the fastest way we can get there ulv frowned in thought if you can drive one of the cars the off-worlders use i know where there are some locked in buildings in this city none of my people know how they are made to move i can work them let's go chance was with them this time the first sand car they found still had the keys in the lock it was battery powered but contained a full charge much quieter than the heavy atomic cars it sped smoothly out of the city and across the sand ahead of them the sun sank in a red wave of color it was six o'clock by the time they reached the tower it was seven and brian's nerves felt as if they were writhing under his skin even though it looked like suicide attacking the tower brought blessed relief it was movement and action and for moments at a time he forgot the bombs hanging over his head the attack was nerve-wrackingly anticlimactic they used the main entrance all ranging soundlessly ahead there was no one in sight once inside they crept down toward the lower rooms where the radiation had been detected only gradually did they realize that the magter tower was completely empty everyone gone ulf grunted sniffing the air in every room that they passed many magter were here earlier but they are gone now do they often desert their towers brian asked never i have never heard of it happening before i can think of no reason why they should do a thing like this well i can brian told him 
They would leave their home if they took something with them of greater value. The bombs. If the bombs were hidden here, they might move them after the attack. Sudden fear hit him. Or they might move them because it is time to take them to the launcher. Let's get out of here the quickest way we can. I smell air from outside, Ul said, coming from down there. This cannot be, because the Magter have no entrance this low in their towers. We blasted one earlier. That could be it. Can you find it? Moonlight shone ahead as they turned an angle of the corridor, and stars were visible through the gaping openings in the wall. It looks bigger than it was, Brian said, as if the Magter had enlarged it. He looked through and saw the tracks on the sand outside. As if they had enlarged it to bring something bulky up from below, and carried it away in whatever made those tracks. Using the opening themselves, they ran back to the sand car. Brian grounded fiercely around and turned the headlights on the tracks. There were the marks of a sand car's treads, half obscured by thin, unmarked wheel tracks. He turned off the lights and forced himself to move slowly and to do an accurate job. A quick glimpse at his watch showed him there were four hours left to go. The moonlight was bright enough to illuminate the tracks. Driving with one hand, he turned on the radio transmitter, already set for craft's wavelength. When the operator acknowledged his signal, Brian reported what they had discovered and his conclusions. Get that message to Commander Kraft now. I can't wait to talk to him. I'm following the tracks. He killed the transmission and stamped on the accelerator. The sand car churned and bounced down the track. They are going to the mountains, Ol said some time later, as the tracks still pointed straight ahead. There are caves there, and many Magter have been seen near them. That is what I have heard. The guess was correct. Before nine o'clock, the ground humped into a range of foothills, and the darker masses of mountains could be seen behind them, rising up to obscure the stars. Stop the car here, Ulf said. The caves begin not too far ahead. There may be Magter watching or listening, so we must go quietly. Brian followed the deep-cut grooves, carrying the radio. Ulv came and went on both sides, silently as a shadow, scouting for hidden watchers. As far as he could discover, there were none. By 9.30, Brian realized they had deserted the sand car too soon. The tracks wound on and on, and seemed to have no end. They passed some caves, which Ulv pointed out to him, but the tracks never stopped. Time was running out, and the nightmare stumbling through the darkness continued. More caves ahead, Ol said. Go quietly. They came cautiously to the crest of a hill, as they had done so many times already, and looked into the shadow valley beyond. Sand covered the valley floor, and the light of the setting moon shone over the tracks at a flat angle, marking them off sharply as lines of shadow. They ran straight across the sandy valley and disappeared into the dark mouth of a cave on the far side. Sinking back behind the hilltop, Brian covered the pilot light with his hand and turned on the transmitter. Ulv stayed above him, staring at the opening of the cave. This is an important message, Brian whispered into the mic. Please record. He repeated this for thirty seconds, glancing at his watch to make sure of the time, since the seconds of waiting stretched to minutes in his brain. Then, as clearly as possible, without raising his voice above a whisper, he told of the discovery of the tracks and the cave. The bombs may or may not be in here, but we are going in to find out. I'll leave my personal transmitter here with the broadcast power turned on, so you can home on its signal. That will give you a directional beacon to find the cave. I'm taking the other radio in. It has more power. If we can't get back to the entrance, I'll try a signal from inside. 
I doubt if you will hear it because of the rock, but I'll try. End of transmission. Don't try to answer me because I have the receiver turned off. There are no earphones on this set, and the speaker would be too loud here. He switched off, held his thumb on the button for an instant, then flicked it back on. Goodbye, Leah, he said, and killed the power for good. They circled and reached the rocky wall of the cliff. Creeping silently in the shadows, they slipped up on the dark entrance of the cave. Nothing moved ahead, and there was no sound from the entrance of the cave. Brian glanced at his watch and was instantly sorry. Ten thirty. The last shelter concealing them was five meters from the cave. They started to rise to rush the final distance when Ulv suddenly waved Brian down. He pointed to his nose, then to the cave. He could smell the magter there. A dark figure separated itself from the greater darkness of the cave mouth. Ulv acted instantly. He stood up, and his hand went to his mouth. Air hissed faintly through the tube in his hand. Without a sound, the magter folded and fell to the ground. Before the body hit, Ulv crouched low and rushed in. There was the sudden scuffling of feet on the floor, then silence. Brian walked in, gun ready and alert, not knowing what he would find. His toe pushed against a body on the ground, and from the darkness, Ulv whispered, There were only two. We can go on now. Finding their way through the cave was a maddening torture. They had no light, nor would they dare use one if they had. There were no wheel marks to follow on the stone floor. Without Ulv's sensitive nose, they would have been completely lost. The cave branched and rejoined, and they soon lost all sense of direction. Walking was almost impossible. They had to grope with their hands before them like blind men. Stumbling and falling against the rock, their fingers were soon throbbing and raw from brushing against the rough walls. Ulv followed the scent of the magter that hung in the air where they had passed. When it grew thin, he knew they had left the frequently used tunnels and entered deserted ones. They could only retrace their steps and start again in a different direction. More maddening than the walking was the way time was running out. Inexorably, the glowing hands crept around the face of Brian's watch until they stood at fifteen minutes before twelve. There is a light ahead, Ulv whispered, and Brian almost gasped with relief. They moved slowly and silently until they stood, concealed by the darkness, looking out into a domed chamber brightly lit by glowing tubes. "'What is it?' Ulv asked, blinking in the painful wash of illumination after the long darkness. Brian had to fight to control his voice to stop from shouting. "'The cage with the metal webbing is a jump space generator. The pointed silver things next to it are bombs of some kind, probably the cobalt bombs.' We've found it! His first impulse was to instantly send the radio call that would stop the waiting fleet of H-bombers. But an unconvincing message would be worse than no message at all. He had to describe exactly what he saw here so the Nijorders would know he wasn't lying. What he told them had to fit exactly with the information they already had about the launcher and the bombs. The launcher had been jury-rigged from a ship's jump space generator, that was obvious. The generator and its controls were neatly cased and mounted. Cables ran from them to a roughly constructed cage of woven metal straps, hammered and bent into shape by hand. Three technicians were working on the equipment. Brian wondered what sort of bloodthirsty war-lovers the Magter had found to handle the bombing for them. Then he saw the chains around their necks and the bloody wounds on their backs. He still found it difficult to have any pity on them. 
they had obviously been willing to accept money to destroy another planet or they wouldn't have been working here they had probably rebelled only when they had discovered how suicidal the attack would be thirteen minutes to midnight cradling the radio against his chest brian rose to his feet he had a better view of the bombs now there were twelve of them alike as eggs from the same deadly clutch pointed like the bow of a spacer each one swept smoothly back for its two meters of length to a sharply chopped off end they were obviously incomplete the warheads of rockets one had its base turned toward him and he saw six projecting studs that could be used to attach it to the missing rocket a circular inspection port was open in the flat base of the bomb this was enough with this description the nigerders would know he couldn't be lying about finding the bombs once they realized this they couldn't destroy dis without first trying to neutralize them brian carefully counted fifty paces before he stopped he was far enough from the cavern so he couldn't be heard and an angle of the cave cut off all light from behind him with carefully controlled movements he turned on the power switched the set to transmit and checked the broadcast frequency all correct then slowly and clearly he described what he had seen in the cavern behind him he kept his voice emotionless recounting facts leaving out anything that might be considered an opinion it was six minutes before midnight when he finished he thumbed the switch to receive and waited there was only silence slowly the empty quality of the silence penetrated his numbed mind there were no crackling atmospherics nor hiss of static even when he turned the power full on the mass of rock and earth of the mountain above was acting as a perfect grounding screen absorbing his signal even at maximum output they hadn't heard him the nijord fleet didn't know that the cobalt bombs had been discovered before their launching the attack would go ahead as planned even now the bomb bay doors were opening armed h-bombs slung above the planet held in place only by their shackles in a few minutes the signal would be given and the shackles would spring open the bombs drop clear killers brian shouted into the microphone you wouldn't listen to reason you wouldn't listen to highs nor me or to any voice that suggested an alternative to complete destruction you are going to destroy dis and it's not necessary there were lots of ways you could have stopped it you didn't do any of them and now it's too late you'll destroy dis and in turn this will destroy nigerd i gel said that and now i believe him you're just another damned failure in a galaxy full of failures he raised the radio above his head and sent it crashing into the rock floor then he was running back to ulv trying to run away from the realization that he too had tried and failed the people on the surface of dis had less than two minutes left to live they didn't get my message brian said to ulv the radio won't work this far underground then the bombs will fall ulv asked looking searchingly at brian's face in the dim reflected light from the cavern unless something happens that we know nothing about the bombs will fall they said nothing after that they simply waited the three technicians in the cavern were also aware of the time they were calling to each other and trying to talk to the magter the emotionless parasite-ridden brains of the magter saw no reason to stop work and they attempted to beat the men back to their tasks in spite of the blows they didn't go they only gaped in horror as the clock hands moved remorselessly towards twelve even the magter dimly felt some of the significance of the occasion they stopped too and waited 
The hour hand touched twelve on Brian's watch, then the minute hand. The second hand closed the gap, and for a tenth of a second the three hands were one. Then the second hand moved on. Brian's immediate sensation of relief was washed away by the chilling realization that he was deep underground. Sound and seismic waves were slow, and the flare of atomic explosions couldn't be seen here. If the bombs had been dropped at twelve, they wouldn't know it at once. A distant rumble filled the air. A moment later the ground heaved under them, and the lights in the cavern flickered. Fine dust drifted down from the roof above. Ulv turned to him, but Brian looked away. He could not face the accusation in the Disson's eyes. End of chapter 17「Chapter Eighteen of Planet of the Damned by Harry Harrison. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eighteen One of the technicians was running and screaming. The Magter knocked him down and beat him into silence. Seeing this, the other two men returned to work with shaking hands. Even if all life on the surface of the planet was dead, this would have no effect on the Magter. They would go ahead as planned, without emotion or imagination enough to alter their set course. As the technicians worked, their attitude changed from shocked numbness to anger. Right and wrong were forgotten. They had been killed. The invisible death of radiation must already be penetrating into the caves. But they also had a chance for vengeance. Swiftly they brought their work to completion with the speed and precision they had concealed before. "'What are those off-worlders doing?' Ulv asked. Brian stirred from his lethargy of defeat and looked across the cavern floor. The men had wheeled a hand truck and were rolling one of the atomic warheads onto it. They pushed it over to the latticework of the jump field. They are going to bomb Nijard now, just as Nijard bombed Dis. That machine will hurl the bombs in a special way to the other planet. Will you stop them? Ulv asked. He had his deadly blowgun in his hand, and his face was an expressionless mask. Brian almost smiled at the irony of the situation. In spite of everything he had done to prevent it, Nijard had dropped the bombs. And this act alone may have destroyed their own planet. Brian had it within his power now to stop the launching in the cavern. Should he? Should he save the lives of his killers? Or should he practice the ancient blood oath that had echoed and destroyed down through the ages, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth? It would be so simple. He literally had to do nothing. The score would be even, and his and the Disson's death avenged. Did Ulv have his blowgun ready to kill Brian with, if he should try to stop the launchings? Or had he misread the Disson entirely? Will you stop them, Ulv? he asked. How large was mankind's sense of obligation? The caveman first had this feeling for his mate, then for his family. It grew until men fought and died for the abstract ideas of cities and nations, then for whole planets. Would the time ever come when men might realize that the obligation should be to the largest and most encompassing reality of all, mankind, and beyond that, to life of all kinds? Brian saw this idea, not in words, but as a reality. When he posed the question to himself in this way, he found that it stated clearly its inherent answer. He pulled his gun out, and as he did, he wondered what Ulv's answer might be. Nijard is Medric, Ulv said, raising his blowgun and sending a dart across the cavern. It struck one of the technicians, who gasped and fell to the floor. 
Brian's shots crashed into the control board, shorting and destroying it, removing the menace to Nijar for all time. Medric, Ulv had said, a life form that cooperates and aids other life forms. It may kill in self defense, but it is essentially not a killer or destroyer. Ulv had a lifetime of knowledge about the interdependency of life. He grasped the essence of the idea and ignored all the verbal complications and confusions. He had killed the Magter, who were his own people, because they were Hom Medric, against life, and he had saved his enemies because they were Medric. With this realization came the painful knowledge that the planet and the people that had produced this understanding were dead. In the cavern the Magter saw the destruction of their plans, and the cave mouth from which the bullets had come. Silently they rushed to kill their enemy, a concerted wave of emotionless fury. Brian and Ulv fought back. Even the knowledge that he was doomed no matter what happened could not resign Brian to death at the hands of the Magter. To Ulv the decision was much easier. He was simply killing Ummetvruk. A believer in life, he destroyed the anti-life. They retreated into the darkness, still firing. The Magter had lights and ion rifles, and were right behind them. Knowing the caverns better than the men they chased, the pursuers circled. Brian saw lights ahead and dragged Ulv to a stop. They know their way through these caves, and we don't, he said. If we try to run, they'll just shoot us down. Let's find a spot we can defend and settle into it. Back here. Ulv gave a tug in the right direction. There is a cave with only one entrance, and that is very narrow. Let's go. Running as silently as they could in the darkness, they reached the dead-end cavern without being seen. What noise they made was lost in other footsteps that sounded and echoed through the connecting caves. Once inside, they found cover behind a ridge and waited. The end was certain. The Magter ran swiftly into their cave, flashing his light into all the places of concealment. The beam passed over the two hidden men, and at the same instant Brian fired. The shot boomed loudly as the Magter fell, a shot that would surely have been heard by the others. Before anyone else came into the cave, Brian ran over and grabbed the still-functioning light. Propping it on the rocks so it shone on the entrance, he hurried back to shelter beside Ulv. They waited for the attack. It was not long in coming. Two Magter rushed in and died. More were outside, Brian knew, and he wondered how long it would be before they remembered the grenades and rolled one into their shelter. An indistinct murmur sounded outside, and sharp explosions. In their hiding place, Brian and Ulv crouched low and wondered why the attack didn't come. Then one of the Magter came in the entrance, but Brian hesitated before shooting. The man had backed in, firing behind him as he came. Ulv had no compunctions about killing, only his darts couldn't penetrate the Magter's thick clothing. As the Magter turned, Ulv's breath pulsed once, and death stung the back of the other man's hand. He collapsed into a crumpled heap. "'Don't shoot!' a voice called from outside the cave, and a man stepped through the swirling dust and smoke to stand in the beam from the light. Brian clutched wildly at Ulv's arm, dragging the blowgun from the Disson's mouth. The man in the light wore a protective helmet, thick boots, and a pouch-hung uniform. He was a Nijarder. The realization was almost impossible to accept. Brian had heard the bombs fall, yet the Nijard soldier was here. The two facts couldn't be accepted together. "'Would you keep a hold on his arm, sir, just in case?' the soldier said, glancing warily at Ulv's blowpipe. I know what those darts can do. He pulled a microphone from one of his pockets and spoke into it. More soldiers crowded into the cave, 
and Professor Commander Kraft came in behind them. He looked strangely out of keeping in the dusty combat uniform. The gun was even more incongruous in his blue-veined hand. After giving the pistol to the nearest soldier with an air of relief, he stumbled quickly over to Brian and took his hand. "'It is a profound and sincere pleasure to meet you in person,' he said, "'and your friend Ulv as well.' "'Would you kindly explain what is going on?' Brian said thickly. He was obsessed by the strange feeling that none of this could possibly be happening. "'We will always remember you as the man who saved us from ourselves,' Kraft said, once again the professor instead of the commander. "'What Brian wants are facts, Grandpa, not speeches,' Hyes said." The bent form of the leader of the rebel Nijord army pushed through the crowd of taller men until he stood next to Kraft. Simply stated, Brian, your plan succeeded. Kraft relayed your message to me, and as soon as I heard it I turned back and met him on his ship. I'm sorry that Telt's dead, but he found what we were looking for. I couldn't ignore his report of radioactive traces. Your girlfriend arrived with the hacked-up corpse at the same time I did, and we all took a long look at the green leech in its skull. Her explanation of what it is made significant sense. We were already carrying out landings when we had your call about something having been stored in the Magter Tower. After that it was just a matter of following tracks and the transmitter you planted. But the explosions at midnight, Brian broke in. I heard them. <laughs> you were supposed to, Hyes laughed. Not only you, but the Magter in this cave. We figured they would be armed and the cave strongly defended. So at midnight we dropped a few large chemical explosive bombs at the entrance, enough to kill the guards without bringing the roof down. We also hoped that the Magter deeper in would leave their posts or retreat from the imagined radiation. And they did. It worked like a charm. We came in quietly and took them by surprise, made a clean sweep, killed the ones we couldn't capture. One of the renegade jump space technicians was still alive, Kraft said. He told us about your stopping the bombs aimed at Nijard, the two of you. None of the Nijarders there could add anything to his words, not even the cynical highs. But Brian could empathize their feelings the warmth of their intense relief and happiness. It was a sensation he would never forget. There is no more war, Brian translated for Ulv, knowing that the Disson had understood nothing of the explanation. As he said it, he realized that there was one glaring error in the story. You couldn't have done it, Brian said. You landed on this planet before you had my message about the tower. That means you were still expecting the Magter to be sending their bombs to Nijord, and you made the landings in spite of this knowledge. Of course, Professor Kraft said, astonished at Brian's lack of understanding. What else could we do? The Magter are sick. He laughed aloud at Brian's baffled expression. <laughs> you have to understand Nijord's psychology, he said. When it was a matter of war and killing, my planet could never agree on an intelligent course. War is so alien to our philosophy that it couldn't even be considered correctly. That's the trouble with being a vegetable eater in a galaxy of carnivores. You're easy prey for the first one that lands on your back. Any other planet would have jumped on the magter with both feet and shaken the bombs out of them. <laughs> we fumbled this so long it almost got both worlds killed. Your mind parasite drew us back from the brink. I don't understand, Brian said. A simple matter of definition. Before you came, we had no way to deal with the Magter here on Dis. They really were alien to us. Nothing they did made sense, and nothing we did seemed to have the slightest effect on them. But you discovered that they were sick, and that's something we know how to handle. We're united again. My rebel army was instantly absorbed into the rest of the Nijord forces by mutual agreement. Doctors and nurses are on the way here now. 
Plans were put underway to evacuate what part of the population we could until the bombs were found. The planet is united again and working hard. Because the Magter are sick, infected by a destructive life form? Brian asked. Exactly so, Professor Kraft said. We are civilized after all. You can't expect us to fight a war, and you surely can't expect us to ignore the plight of sick neighbors. No, you surely can't, Brian said, sitting down heavily. He looked at Ulv, to whom the speech had been incomprehensible. Beyond him, Hyes wore his most cynical expression as he considered the frailties of his people. Hyes, Brian called out. You translate all that into Disson and explain to Ulv. I wouldn't dare. End of chapter 18《Chapter Nineteen of Planet of the Damned by Harry Harrison. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nineteen Dis was a floating golden ball looking like a schoolroom globe in space. No clouds obscured its surface, and from this distance it seemed warm and attractive set against the cold darkness. Brian almost wished he were back there now, as he sat shivering inside the heavy coat. He wondered how long it would be before his confused body temperature controls decided to turn off the summer adjustment. He hoped it wouldn't be as sudden or as dramatic as turning it on had been. Delicate as a dream, Leah's reflections swam in space next to the planet. She had come up quietly behind him in the spaceship's corridor, only her gentle breath and mirrored face telling him she was there. He turned quickly and took her hands in his. "'You're looking infinitely better,' he said. "'Well, I should,' she said, pushing back her hair in an unconscious gesture with her hand. "'I've been doing nothing but lying in the ship's hospital, while you were having such a fine time this last week.' "'Rushing around down there, shooting all the Magter?' "'Just gassing them,' he told her. "'The Nijorders can't bring themselves to kill any more, "'even if it does raise their own casualty rate. "'In fact, they are having difficulty restraining the Dissons led by Ulv, "'who are happily killing any Magter they see as being pure Umedverk. "'What will they do when they have all those frothing Magter madmen?' They don't know yet, he said. They won't really know until they see what an adult Magder is like with his brain parasite dead and gone. They're having better luck with the children. If they catch them early enough, the parasite can be destroyed before it has done too much damage. Leah shuddered delicately and let herself lean against him. I'm not that sturdy yet. Let's sit down while we talk. There was a couch opposite the viewport where they could sit and still see Dis. "'I hate to think of a Magter deprived of his symbiote,' she said. "'If his system can stand the shock, I imagine there will be nothing left except a brainless hulk. "'This is one series of experiments I don't care to witness. "'I rest secure in the knowledge that the Nijorders will find the most humane solution.' "'I'm sure they will.' Brian said. Now, what about us? she said, disconcertingly, leaning back in his arms. I must say, you have the highest body temperature of anyone I have ever touched. It's positively exciting. This jarred Brian even more. He didn't have her ability to put past horrors out of the mind by substituting present pleasures. "'Well, just what about us?' he said, with masterful inappropriateness. She smiled as she leaned against him. "'You weren't as vague as that the night in the hospital room. I seem to remember a few other things you said, and did. You can't claim you're completely indifferent to me, Brian Brand. So I'm only asking you what any outspoken Anvarian girl would.' Where do we go from here? Get married? There was a definite pleasure in holding her slight body in his arms and feeling her hair against his cheek. 
they both sensed it and this awareness made his words sound that much more ugly leah darling you know how important you are to me but you certainly realize that we could never get married her body stiffened and she tore herself away from him why you great fat egotistical slab of meat what do you mean by that i like you leah we have plenty of fun and games together but surely you realize that you aren't the kind of girl one takes home to mother leah hold on he said you know better than to say a thing like that what i said has nothing to do with how i feel towards you but marriage means children and you are biologist enough to know about earth's genes intolerant yokel she cried slapping his face he didn't move or attempt to stop her i expected better from you with all your pretensions of understanding but all you can think of are the horror stories about the worn-out genes of earth you're the same as every other big strapping bigot from the frontier planets i know how you look down on our small size our allergies and hemophilia and all the other weaknesses that have been bred back and preserved by the race you hate but that's not what i meant at all he interrupted shocked his voice drowning hers out yours are the strong genes the viable strains mine are the deadly ones a child of mine would kill itself and you in a natural birth if it managed to live to term you're forgetting that you are the original homo sapiens i'm a recent mutation leah was frozen by his words they revealed a truth she had known but would never permit herself to consider earth is home the planet where mankind developed he said the last few thousand years you may have been breeding weaknesses back into your genetic pool but that's nothing compared to the hundred millions of years that it took to develop man how many newborn babes live to be a year of age on earth why almost all of them a fraction of one percent die each year i can't recall exactly how many earth is home he said again gently when men leave home they can adapt to different planets but a price must be paid a terrible price is in dead infants the successful mutations live the failures die natural selection is a brutally simple affair when you look at me you see a success i have a sister a success too yet my mother had six other children who died when they were still babies and several others that never came to term you know about these things don't you leah i know i know she said sobbing into her hands he held her now and she didn't pull away i know it all as a biologist but i am so awfully tired of being a biologist and top of my class and a mental match for any man when i think of you i do it as a woman and can't admit any of this i need someone brian and i needed you so much because i loved you she paused and wiped her eyes you're going home aren't you back to anvar when i can't wait too long he said unhappily aside from my personal wants i find myself remembering that i'm a part of anvar when you think of the number of people who suffered and died or adapted so that i could be sitting here now well it's a little frightening i suppose it doesn't make sense logically that i should feel indebted to them but i do anything i do now or in the next few years won't be as important as getting back to anvar and i won't be going back with you it was a flat statement the way she said it not a question no you won't be he said there's nothing on anvar for you leah was looking out of the port at dis and her eyes were dry now way back in my deeply buried unconscious i think i knew it would end this way she said if you think your little lecture on the origins of man was a novelty it wasn't it just reminded me of a number of things my glands had convinced me to forget 
In a way, I envy you your weightlifter wife-to-be and your happy kitties, but not very much. Very early in life I resigned myself to the fact that there was no one on earth I would care to marry. I always had these teenage dreams of a hero from space who would carry me off, and I guess I slipped you into the pattern without realizing it. I'm old enough now to face the fact that I like my work more than a banal marriage, and I'll probably end up a frigid and virtuous old maid, with more degrees and titles than you have shot-putting records. As they looked through the port, Dis began slowly to contract. Their ship drew away from it, heading towards Nijord. They sat apart without touching now. Leaving Dis meant leaving behind something they had shared. They had been strangers together there on a strange world. For a brief time their lifelines had touched. That time was over now. "'Don't we look happy?' Heiss said, shambling towards them. "'Fall dead and make me even happier, then,' Leah snapped bitterly. Heiss ignored the acid tone of her words and sat down on the couch next to them. Since leaving command of his rebel Nijord army, he seemed much mellower. "'Going to keep on working for the Cultural Relationships Foundation, Brian?' he asked. "'You're the kind of man we need.' Brian's eyes widened as the meaning of the last words penetrated. "'Are you in the CRF?' "'Field agent for Nijord,' he said. I hope you don't think those helpless office types like Fossil and Merv really represented us there. They just took notes and acted as a front and cover for the organization. Nijord is a fine planet, but a gentle guiding hand behind the scenes is needed to help them find their place in the galaxy before they are pulverized. What's your dirty game, Heiss? Leah asked, scowling. I've had enough hints to suspect for a long time that there was more to the CRF than the sweetness and light part I have seen. Are you people egomaniacs, power-hungry, or what? That's the first charge that would be leveled at us if our activities were publicly known, Heiss told her. That's why we do most of our work undercover. The best fact I can give you to counter the charge is money. Just where do you think we get the funds for an operation this size? He smiled at their blank looks. You'll see the records later, so there won't be any doubt. The truth is that all our funds are donated by planets we have helped. Even a tiny percentage of a planetary income is large. Add enough of them together, and you have enough money to help other planets. And voluntary gratitude is a perfect test if you stop to think about it. You can't talk people into liking what you have done. They have to be convinced. There have always been people on CRF worlds who knew about our work and agreed with it enough to see that we are kept in funds. Why are you telling me all this super-secret stuff? Leah asked. Isn't that obvious? We want you to keep on working for us. You can name whatever salary you like. As I've said, there is no shortage of ready cash. Heiss glanced quickly at them both and delivered the clinching argument. I hope Brian will go on working with us, too. He is the kind of field agent we desperately need, and it is almost impossible to find. Just show me where to sign, Leah said, and there was life in her voice once again. I wouldn't exactly call it blackmail, Brian smiled. But I suppose if you people can juggle planetary psychologies, you must find that individuals can be pushed around like chessmen, though you should realize that very little pushing is required this time. Will you sign on? Heiss asked. I must go back to Anvar, Brian said, but there really is no pressing hurry. Earth, said Leah, is overpopulated enough as it is. End of chapter 19 End of Planet of the Damned by Harry Harrison This book recorded by Phil Chenevere in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, April of 2018